There, my little one, rest your sweet head. Tomorrow, we shall announce your name to the kingdom, and all will know that you are Princess Scarlet and... My dear! Xavier, I thought Jasper was helping you in the bath. He did. Well, that was fast. Rose, my love, come here. There are things that must be said in secret. What's wrong, my love? We are no longer safe here. When Jasper drew the water, he placed his hand on the bath first. The side of the basin was laced with poison. Someone wants me dead. What? Is Jasper all right? Yes, the magic your sisters gave him. I don't know, it's like he's resistant. Rose, I know you have feared this day from the moment your magic made me who I am. Thawed and soul in Xavier's body. I feel them both. They fight within me. I can almost hear Thorden's voice in these walls. I sense his dark presence all over the castle. He may be only a body without a soul, but his dark magic, he is capable of much more than meets the eye. We must leave this place. I've asked Jasper to prepare the horse. We leave tonight. Where will we go? I know a place, but I dare not speak it. We will start a new life. And these memories, this life of fear, it will finally be dead to us. The sun was setting. King Xavier walked over to the crib and picked up a tiny baby wrapped in blue silk. He cradled her in his arms as he held her tight against his chest. <coughs> don't, don't hold her so tight, darling. Xavier looked up and stared into Rose's eyes. And in that moment, as the last ray of sun fell beneath the sky, Xavier's skin turned into charcoal and crumbled to the ground. Thornton, give her to me! The Red Witch lunged forward and threw herself onto the Black One. But in that moment, he vanished, and she collapsed to the floor, sobbing. <sighs> darling, darling, relax! The Red Witch opened her eyes. You had a bad dream, that's all. Shh, relax, I'm here. It's all right. Xavier held his wife in his arms as he stroked her hair. He took a... He took a baby away! Where is she? The Red Witch yanked off her blankets and fled to the nearby crib. It was only a dream, Rose. No! She's gone! My baby is gone! Thornton, you will pay! Is it just me, or is that owl watching us? Yes, it is. It has been following us for the past three hours. What does it want? It is the black one's eye. That's how he knows exactly where we are. Can we not have any secrets from him? It won't hurt her, Scarlet. The black one wants us to get to him. He's not going to stop you here. Just wants you to be afraid. So that, by the time you get there, you are weak and vulnerable to his touch. You must remain strong. Ignore everything around you. Keep your mind on Coyote. Jasper continued to lead Scarlet through the forest of shadows. The cool breeze blew around them like the hands of ghosts fingering their shoulders. 
Around every tree lurked a shadow, yet all remained still. Every moment brought with it the dread of waiting for the face of a demon, yet the absence of any chilling face in those shadows only prolonged the agony. You know, I've been thinking. Do you remember when I cast my first spell to make you look like Coyote? How could I forget? I've never been this athletic in my life. Well, it certainly worked wonders at the engagement ball. You were quite the charmer. However, I want to test my magic and make you Jasper again. As much as I'm going to hate being a scrawny runt again, I think you have come a long way with the magic lessons. So, impress me, my lady. Turn me back into Jasper. Scarlet stopped and turned to look at Jasper. It was strange to see the face of her beloved coyote looking back at her, knowing that it was really Jasper inside. She closed her eyes and centered all her energy on Coyote. Scarlet looked up at Jasper, shocked to find him still looking exactly like Coyote. It didn't work. Remember, your magic works on love. Try again, close your eyes, and think of how much you love Coyote. Ipsuma. Piloth que reditum. Scarlet looked up. It's not working. That's impossible. You turned me into Coyote. I cannot undo it. Like all those other things I transformed, it's, it's like I can only do half the spell. Half the spell? Scarlet, I'm going to ask you a direct question. Do you still feel the same towards Coyote as you did when we were first at the castle? Of course! I mean, Scarlet! Jasper put his hand on her shoulder. It's all right if you don't. Jasper, I would tell you the truth if anything had changed in my heart. I am not travelling through the forest of shadows for my own delight. Even the star Coyote gave me that represents our love is shining brightly. There is something else wrong, and I can assure you, it is not the feeling in my heart. When I recite the spell, I feel weak. It's as if I'm trying to lift a heavy stone with only half the strength. It's the only way I can describe it. I just don't understand. Let's keep walking. They forged on. Tiny beings from the eyes of the dead trees. The owl sat perched atop a high tree and blinked. The eye had seen. There, my pet. You serve your purpose well. The forest of shadows likes owls like you. And so do I. You show me through your eye all that you see. Ugh, and I see Scarlet is getting closer, but her magic seems weak. Still, she has too much help from her little guardian, Jasper. If Scarlet were on her own, she would be more afraid. She would not know what to do or how to cast a spell. She is determined enough to find me. Yes. Perhaps it is about time we played a little game. Coyote, come! Yes, my lord. The black one held a piece of rope in his hand. <gasps> Does this rope look familiar? <laughs> the last time you saw it, you were tied up in it. Well, it is nice that our little Princess Scarlet and Jasper cannot tie a proper knot. In fact, Scarlet does not know much of anything, to be honest. Yet, she has something I want. And what might that be? Oh, you see, it's very simple. I want the magic of her soul to reclaim mine from her father, her selfish mother. 
infusing my soul into my brother's body. You're going to help me, Coyote. It just so happens that her trusty guardian, Jasper, looks a lot like, well, you these days. <sighs> what I'd like you to do is eliminate Jasper and play his part. Lead Scarlet to the edge of the earth. I want her to feel it slip away from her foot as I take everything from her the way her parents took everything from me. They thought they could stop me. They may have delayed me, but they will not stop me. The war begins! Ah! What happened? Ah, stupid root! I've hurt my ankle. Let me look. Ugh. You've caught a bad sprain. Jasper put his hand against his ribs on one side and pulled it back. Blood was dripping from his fingers. <gasps> Scarlet looked frightened. She pulled his shirt up and gaped as a large piece of wood sat lodged into Jasper's ribs. Jasper! Ugh, I thought I felt more than an ankle. Let me try to heal it. Ugh! Pere oth sona me thornre. Scarlet looked up at Jasper. Well? Um, the ankle feels a bit better, but this is a problem. Blood was coming out of the wound even quicker. Who? Oh. Shall I pull it out? No! You need to fetch water and clean the wound. There is a lake not far from here. I have heard it can heal. Healing waters? In this forest? It is the only one. It is what gives these trees hope. They say only a pure heart can see the lake. Look to the sky and follow the moon. When it becomes a full moon, lower your gaze, and there the lake will lie. All right, I'll hurry. Wait, Scarlet! Whatever you do, do not take anything more than the water. Scarlet hesitated, then nodded and looked up as she started to walk away from Jasper. He watched as she slid behind a nearby tree. Was she ready to be alone in the forest? The shooting pain in his side reminded him that unless he let go and allow Scarlet to face her fears now, he may not survive to help her in the great battle that lied ahead. All of a sudden, a hand appeared out from behind a tree and covered Jasper's mouth. A voice spoke in his ear. Trying to impersonate me? Do you know what I do with impersonators? I eliminate them. Fortunately for you, I want the pleasure of watching you feel absolutely helpless as you see your beloved pupil get whisked away by the real coyote. Isn't that what you wanted all along? A happy reuniting of the two lovebirds. Oh, you're still surprised to see me, aren't you? Let me assure you that whatever skill you may have in teaching magic, you lack in rope tying. But don't worry, I'm going to give you a lesson, and you're going to learn how to tie better knots. The soulless coyote, under the command of the Black One, quickly switched clothes with Jasper so that he was once again in his own royal attire, while Jasper was back in his servant's clothes. Jasper had lost so much blood already that he was too weak to fight back. The spell that Scarlet had placed on him at the engagement ball still had its effect, and Jasper looked identical to Coyote in face and body. Much better. Coyote looked up at the owl, who immediately swooped down and grabbed Jasper's shirt at the back of his neck with one talon and Coyote's with the other. It lifted them both to the highest branch of the tree, where Coyote forcefully tied Jasper's hands and feet to the top of the trunk. Coyote took a cloth and tied it around Jasper's mouth. He broke off a piece of branch and slammed it into his own rib, lodging it into his side just as Jasper's. Ugh. Coyote looked up at the owl, who swooped over and placed him on the ground where Jasper had laid moments ago. 
There he waited as Jasper sat helplessly above in the tree, blood dripping from his side, and worried in cold sweat for Scarlet's safety. His head drowned in misery. How could he have let this happen? He was supposed to be Scarlet's guardian. How could he not know why her magic was not improving? What was he missing? Years of study and preparation for this day, only to succumb to a deadly branch and a stupid owl? And now Scarlet would return and set off with her beloved unbeknownst to her, controlled by the Black One, with only half her magic to help. Jasper looked up at the sky. There was no moon. Darkness had arrived. Scarlet shivered. The breeze was cold. She kept her eye to the sky, and slowly a dim light began to form. It grew brighter with each step, and soon it became a full yellow moon shining upon her. She stopped and slowly lowered her head. Out of nowhere appeared a glorious silver lake that looked as if it was shimmering in the light of the moon. Scarlet could not take her eye off the water. It's so beautiful. She continued to walk, slowly drawn to the water. This place, so beautiful. She reached the side of the bank and stooped down. The water was clear, revealing small diamonds amongst the rocks in the bank. They glistened under the light of the moon. Scarlet reached for her drinking sack and slowly lowered it into the cool water. The water quickly filled the sack as if it was reaching out to her. Scarlet lifted the bag from the water and noticed her engagement ring glisten in the light. She looked down at the diamonds in the water. They were much larger and sparkled brilliantly. The water splashed and Scarlet looked up. A beautiful woman robed in a flowing white dress rose from the water. She was adorned with jewels. Welcome, daughter of the Red Witch. I've been expecting you. Do you like what you see here? Very much. Go ahead. Pick a diamond. There are many pretty jewels in this water that can surely suit a princess to be. Scarlet looked down. Hundreds of spectacular diamonds sparkled all around her. One appeared to come from nowhere and caught her attention. It was partially buried in the sand. She reached into the water and pulled it up. It was breathtaking. She held it in her hand, admiring the way it sparkled in the moonlight. It would have made a fine engagement ring. Scarlet turned her hand over and looked at her ring. It is much larger than the one Coyote gave you, isn't it? Why don't you take off your ring and see how much better that diamond would look on your finger? Scarlet pulled off her ring and held the diamond against her finger where the ring used to sit. It's so brilliant. There are many more diamonds you can have. You may have the entire lake of diamonds. Wouldn't you like that? Scarlet looked up at the woman, but now she looked different. She looked exactly like Scarlet, with diamonds and breathtaking jewels flowing all down her red gown and woven into her hair. She wore the most exquisite crown on her head and held a gold scepter in her hand with a large ruby encased in gold threading at the top. Do you like your reflection? Yes. This can be you, Queen Scarlet, the most beautiful and admired royal in all the land. Scarlet's grip on her engagement ring began to loosen. Come with me. Come into the lake, where the largest jewels still await you. Let go of Coyote. Come and embrace a new future. Scarlet placed one foot in the water. 
You don't need him to be queen. You are the daughter of Thordan, the rightful king of Eldalotta, and the most powerful of all. Let go of Coyote, and embrace what Thordan can give you. Let him in. Let him enter your mind. Let him enter your soul. Come into the water, Scarlet. The ring started to slip from Scarlet's hand as she lifted her other foot from the bank and moved it toward the water. The light of the moon was glowing all around the woman. But wait, there was another light, a smaller one, a star. It meant something. She couldn't quite remember, but had a feeling it was significant. The higher she lifted her foot, the dimmer the star got. She felt weak. Its brightness seemed to depend on her, and her strength depended on the star. Why was that? Was something else depending on her? Perhaps someone? Why was she here again? Forget about them, Scarlet. They cannot give you what Thorin can. Just come into the water. They? Who are they? Scarlet looked down at the diamond in her hand and saw the water sack. The water. Water of hope. Healing water. Someone was hurt. Someone was depending on her. The root. Jasper. His blood. Let go of them. Their path is hard. Come. My path is easy. Don't you want all of Eldolotta to love you and respect you for all the sacrifices you've made? You were born for greatness. You can become the most powerful woman in all of Eldolotta. Don't you want that? Scarlet looked up at the woman. Yes, but I'll do it my way. Scarlet drove her foot back into the sand of the bank. I will never give Thord in my soul. She plunged the ring back on her finger and threw the diamond at the woman, causing her to shatter into millions of tiny diamonds that fell like drops of rain into the water. Scarlet grabbed her sack of water and began to run. The water rose like a giant funnel from beneath the lake. It began to harden into a serpent beast made of ice and crystals like shards of glass. It ripped through the water and lunged after Scarlet. She looked back and kept running. The beast destroyed everything in its path. It was easily the height of the tallest trees. It discarded them as if they were tiny stones. Scarlet's heart raced with fear as she forged onward, deeper and darker into the forest. The beast slammed its crystal wings into sides of trees. It smashed its tail in the ground as it lunged towards Scarlet and snapped at her with enormous jaws. The owl was flying overhead. It blinked its eye and another ring lifted. Scarlet collapsed to the ground and turned onto her back. The beast roared forward and stood over Scarlet, its tongue protruding like a snake. The glare of its eyes bore into Scarlet as it prepared to make its kill. She held her breath and looked up to the sky in terror waiting for her final moment. All of a sudden, she noticed her star shining right over top of the beast. She closed her eyes. Coyote! Light from the star instantly expanded and shot down from the heavens. The beast looked up as the light moved closer to its neck. Right before it was about to penetrate the beast, it stopped. Darn magic! The beast turned to Scarlet and smirked. She held her breath. Even her magic could not save her now. It was over. She was about to close her eyes when she noticed a flicker of light moving on the face of the dragon. Coyote's ring! She lifted her hand up to the light and held it sideways above her face, reflecting the light of the star directly onto the ice dragon. 
Ildalotta wins today. The light penetrated through the core of the dragon's body, cracking it from within. Shards of ice crystals rained down and shattered on top of Scarlet as the beast disintegrated into nothing. Ah! Scarlet threw her hands over her head and crouched into a ball as the ice glass rained down. She looked up. Somehow she was fine. The dragon was no more. Scarlet got up. She grabbed her water sack and looked up to the star. Poop lives on. She turned and began walking through the forest, following the light of the moon, this time as it got dimmer. It led her directly to Jasper, who was still lying where she had left him. Your skin is cold. She took the water from the sack and poured some on the wound. She then pulled out the stick, and the blood stopped. Jasper opened his eyes. Thank you. Scarlet grabbed his hand and smiled. She did not see the blood from the real Jasper sliding down the trunk as he sat high in the tree, almost unconscious, watching his purpose slip away. Coyote sat up. You ought to have hope. Let's take the rest of this, just in case one of us should fall. Scarlet pulled him to his feet and began walking with him. Coyote looked up at the owl and smiled. The hour drew late. Scarlet and Coyote were long gone. Eddie Man would have been dead by now, but the spell that Scarlet's aunts had placed on Jasper years ago prolonged his life. His skin grew cold and clammy, his breathing more shallow. To open a single eye took every amount of strength within him, but his heart was pure and his will to fight unstoppable. Jasper looked down where Coyote had laid. If only he could have had some of that water. Even the extra that spilled onto the soil would have been enough for him. The soil! Jasper saw the mud where the lake water had soaked into the ground. He just needed to get down from the tree. He pulled his arms. His wrists were tightly woven with a thick rope around the trunk. The knot was tight. It would be impossible to wiggle free. Jasper pressed his feet on the branch which he had been sitting on. He forced himself to stand and pushed his tied wrists up against the trunk and then pulled down with all his might back and forth. The roughness of the trunk began to slowly fray at the rope. The more he moved, the more blood he lost, but he didn't care. He pushed and pulled with all his might. He didn't spend the latter half of his life preparing for this day, only to have it lost on a foolish trick. The rope began to give way. Jasper gained momentum and broke loose. Without any strength left to hold him up, he collapsed like a fallen corpse to the ground. Scarlet and Coyote came to the top of a hill that overlooked a grassy valley. We're past the forest of shadows. Coyote looked at Scarlet and smiled. You did it. We did it. But there's still a long way to go. In the distance, Scarlet could see the terrain becoming more rocky and dark as it got closer to the dark mountain. It boiled with an evil fire in the distance as the Black One prepared his armies of men, soulless bodies like puppets, to the whim of evil. She wasn't just fighting for Coyote. How many other souls of men and women were stolen and held captive by the touch of darkness? For the first time, Scarlet began to realize that this was bigger than Eldolata. She was fighting for humanity, and she had to succeed. 
She forged onward with Coyote, down the steep valley. The wind was getting colder, and the sky was getting darker. Scarlet rubbed her hands over her shoulders. It's getting colder, isn't it? I wish I had brought something warmer. Why don't you create a cloak? I don't believe you've learned that one yet. Jasper, this whole thing with my magic, it's like I'm only at half power. What if I try something and it goes horribly wrong? I can't risk it. Not until we figure out what's wrong with me. Half power? Scarlet looked at Jasper. You really did lose a lot of blood. Don't you remember what happened right after you fell? I'm sorry, it's still a little foggy. When I tried to heal you, your wound got worse, Jasper. That's why I can't risk it. I need you by my side. When I was alone at the lake fighting that beast, I realized just how much I truly need you. I don't know what I would do if you weren't here with me. All the more reason we have to figure out what's wrong with your magic. There is a spell. A diagnostic spell. It may help us understand what is holding your magic back. I think if there is any spell you should try, it needs to be that one. You really think it will help? Scarlet, do you realize the greatness of evil you are up against? You will need every drop of magic in your veins to stand a chance against the Black One. If you don't fix your magic now, you're going to walk into the Dark Mountain and what? Show him your ballroom pass? Do you think you can just waltz in there and kill him like that? Without a fight? Without magic? Cast the spell. We might be able to repair your magic before we reach the mountain. <sighs> You're right. Teach me the spell. Coyote's heart skipped a beat, for he had no intention of teaching her a diagnostic spell. That is, if one even existed. No. He had something much better planned for Scarlet. Close your eyes. And repeat after me. Scarlet did as she was told. Coyote couldn't help but curl his lip into the slightest little smirk as he delighted in reciting the next spell. Horiat ve grandis ipsuum. Horiat ve grandis ipsuum. Oh, I feel strange. I feel <gasps> small. Scarlet collapsed into Coyote's arms as she fainted and began to shrink into the size of a fairy. She laid on the ground, the stones now the size of boulders for her, blades of grass like entire trees. Her eyes opened dimly, and she stared up at Coyote, who was looking down at her. What's happening? I give you a shrinking spell. <sighs> Why are you doing this? Oh, it's complicated, Scarlet. Let's just say, I'm not who you think I am. While you were off fighting lake dragons, I was busy dealing with a little impersonator problem. You know, I must say, your magic made Jasper look quite convincing as me. It's just a shame he probably won't live to see your magic progress further. Oh, I'm sorry. You've already reached your peak, haven't you? Well, now your size reflects the greatness of your magic. Where is Jasper? Right where you left him, dear. He was right under your nose. Or should I say, you were under his? Really, Scarlet, are you going to be this daft when we're married? So now you have two choices. You either go in that direction to trying to rescue your pathetic guardian, or you carry on that way, and you face the black one alone. Like that. It's your choice, my dear. Either way, I'm staying out of it. After all, didn't you want me tied up? Good luck, love. Do you honestly think that this little circus trick of yours can intimidate me? If there's anyone impersonating Coyote, it's you, Thornton. I'm not afraid of you. No matter how you look or try to persuade me, you will never win. My Coyote would never do this to me. You will never win. 
and I'm quite glad to be on my own, thank you very much. Go ahead and run back to the black one. Send him small regards. As you wish. Coyote turned his back on Scarlet and vanished. Rain began to fall and fall. Scarlet knelt to the ground and wept. It's over. <laughs> it's over, Jasper. <laughs> she looked up to the sky. You bloody star! You torture me! Why do you keep shining? Coyote's love is obviously gone. The way he speaks to me, his eyes are empty. My heart cannot take much more. Please, help me. I cannot do this alone. In that moment, the lake water from the soil had absorbed into Jasper's skin as he laid unconscious on the ground. His wound began to heal, and the light of the star shone upon him. He slowly opened his eyes and realized he was alive. He sat up and felt his wound. It was gone. He had been healed. He looked down at the torn rope on the ground. Drops of rain began falling all over him. Coyote. Scarlet. He shot to his feet and began running, soaked in the falling rain. Scarlet! He ran faster than he had ever run in his entire life. He looked up to the star. If it could shine, even without Coyote's soul, it proved that love really does conquer all. He had to tell Scarlet, hope was not lost. Morning came, and Scarlet laid on the ground where she had cried herself to sleep. Large clovers hovered over her head. The grass was a thickly tangled jungle. A breeze swept over her small body, and a voice could be heard in the wind. Though you have journeyed long and far, you should not question the shining star. Though it may seem the sun has set, there will be light tomorrow. Scarlet opened her eyes. What's that sound? Though you have to turn and long and far. Scarlet sat up. You should not question the shining star. Who's there? Who's singing that? Scarlet shot up. She pushed her way through the tall grass and followed the voice. It became louder. Though it may seem the sun has set, there will be light to There, within the blades of thick grass, was a mushroom. Hello. A face appeared on the mushroom. You're a mushroom. And you're small. I'm sorry, I'm Scarlet. I know. Was that you singing just now? Don't be ridiculous. Mushrooms can't sing. But I thought I heard... Aren't you going to introduce me to your friend? My friend? Why, I'm all alone. Nonsense! Look behind you! Scarlet turned and saw no one. I'm sorry, I don't see anyone. She leaned in close to the mushroom. You're not one of those hallucinating mushrooms, are you? You know, hallucinations are a rather fascinating thing. How does one actually determine what is real and what is not? 
Maybe it is simply that you cannot see what is before your eyes. That's nonsense. Everyone knows that certain plants can trick the mind to see things that aren't there, mushrooms in particular. Says the woman who just heard singing a while ago. I don't know what I heard. It probably was the wind. Now you doubt your senses. Have they failed you before? Yes. I mean, no. I don't want to be having this conversation. All right. What would you like to talk about? I need to find my friend. So you do have a friend? No. I mean, yes. Ah! He's in the Forest of Shadows, and I can't see which direction to travel. The grass is too tall. I can't see anything. It's hopeless. Scarlet. What? Look down on the ground and tell me what you see. Dirt? Stones? No, you're thinking too literally. Look again. Scarlet stared at the ground. Too literally? What could I possibly be missing? She raised her hand to rub the side of her head and noticed something move. My shadow. There you go. The forest of shadows draws the dark side in all. Follow your shadow and it will lead you to Jasper. Scarlet turned around to face her shadow. Thank you. Beware of the forest witch. Some say that she is the daughter of the red witch. That makes her very dangerous. The red witch is my, I mean, my greatest fear too. Wait, how did you know my friend's name is Jasper? Scarlet turned around, but the mushroom was gone. What? How does a mushroom disappear? The wind blew. Am I hallucinating? She turned and began to follow her shadow. What could that mushroom have meant? Was it suggesting that I am the forest witch? It doesn't make sense. Maybe it was all in her head. But she remembered the words of the white witch when she began this journey and doubted Jasper. Do not doubt your senses. The black one will enter your mind when it is at war with itself. She definitely saw a mushroom, and it was singing. But what could a crazy mushroom know of her life? She had no choice but to trust and walk on. Thick blades of grass towered over her. The hot sun blazed down. Hour upon hour passed, and finally the grassy forest led her to an opening where water from the rain had left behind a large puddle, which seemed to Scarlet as an ocean. Random strays of grass poked through the water as if it were a marsh. Fantastic. I've got to cross this thing. <sighs> Gentil day. Scarlet felt her magic surge through her fingertips, and a large leaf appeared before her. Ugh, half a leaf? What on earth am I supposed to do with that? I was hoping for a boat. Next time, I'll wish for two, and maybe I'll get one. Oh, that's actually not a bad idea. Tuum gentil day. Scarlet opened her eyes, and before her sat two leaves, both in half pieces. She looked up to the star. Not funny. As she looked up, an enormous bumblebee flew over her head. It must have noticed her red gown because it began to circle back towards her and landed on the top of a grass blade. Hello there, Scarlet waved out her hand, but the bee pulled back in fear. Please don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. The bee pulled its legs up and quickly flew away ground began to rumble. Oh dear, that bee wasn't afraid of me, was it? The sound of grass rustling could be heard in the near distance. It was being forced aside as something large trampled closer. Scarlet froze, unsure of what to do. A massive spider burst through the grass and fixated on Scarlet immediately. It began lunging after her. Scarlet could see its sharp fangs dripping with blood from an earlier victim. The hairs from its body stood on end as it moved in closer on Scarlet. She looked up. It was opening its mouth. Razor teeth pulled open and a large glob of silk webbing was forced out. Scarlet dodged the silk, 
and pulled out her sword. She lunged after the spider and thrashed one of its legs. It pulled back and cocked its head, plotting its next move. Scarlet wasted no time. She raised her sword with both hands over her head and charged forward, running under the spider and driving her sword into its underbelly. Scarlet yanked out the sword as spider blood rained down on her. The spider arched its legs up and pulled back, squirming as it further propelled itself backward by pushing its legs out. The trail of blood followed as it retreated into the dark shadows of the grass. Scarlet knelt on the ground and caught her breath. She looked over at her two half-leaves, drenched in spider silk. Ugh, gross. A thought dawned on her, and her face flashed a smile. Minutes later, she had glued the leaves together with the spider's silk. It made a small canoe that was perfect for her to row across the marsh. The horizon slowly pulled down the sun and it grew darker. Scarlet tore off a long stem of grass to use as an oar and climbed into her craft. Mist rose up and enveloped Scarlet as she moved silently across the water. Not a creature stirred. The water was silent, dark, yet it seemed to befriend her. It asked nothing of her and simply allowed the time and Scarlet to pass with it. Scarlet focused on the bank that lied ahead. Her body was still and her gaze resolute. She dare not look down into the marsh water. She could sense the horrible secrets that lay beneath the surface. But somehow, the water was granting her passage so long as she dared not disturb the peace of the underworld beneath. Her boat glided on the water's surface, a watery tightrope that if the moment should pass of looking down, all balance would be disturbed. She dare not peek. The boat slid onto the shore. Scarlet slowly stood up and stepped gracefully onto the rocks. She picked up her craft and pulled it off the bank. The water was a sea of glass, dark secrets hidden beneath the light of the moon. It kept to itself, untouched, hidden, for now. Scarlet climbed a few rocky stones and found herself under a canopy of shrubs that appeared in her size as large, bushy trees. Under this canopy were the most incredible night creatures. Bright, colorful lights flashed all about, and the moon cast a beautiful green and blue glow under the canopy. Small creatures floated in the air, and plump gnomes rolled around in the wet soil. All seemed so alive. It was a spectacular party, a night frenzy, A waterfall was nearby, and its water burst forth a pink glow. Sea creatures swam through the air like flashes of light. Butterflies and dolphins with the ears of rabbits. They both hopped and swam in the air, playing joyfully yet gracefully together. No one would ever be able to notice this beautiful nightlife if they were not as small as Scarlet was. She cautiously stepped forward. A nearby gnome noticed her presence and stopped to look at her. Scarlet walked on. Soon, every creature began to notice her and stopped to stare. A floating dolphin rabbit approached her. Scarlet timidly reached out her hand. The dolphin paused, studying her, unsure if it could trust her. It was almost as if it could sense who she really was heir to the throne of Eldolota, daughter of the Red Witch. Immediately, it bumped its head against the palm of her hand as if to be petted. Oh! The other creatures cried out in joy and circled around Scarlet, 
playing with her as she smiled and laughed along with them. Scarlet looked up and became still. She noticed coming from one of the tree stems was a door with steps leading toward it. She began to walk over to it. The creature stiffened, but followed her. What is behind the door? One of the dolphin rabbits swam over and blocked Scarlet from entering the door. Why do you block me? Who is in there? All was silent. Scarlet walked up the steps, and the creatures began to step back and hide behind the rocks. One of the gnomes spoke up. That is the home of the forest witch. She has dark and powerful magic. The forest witch? So it's true. Please do not disturb her. I'm sorry, I must know who she is. Scarlet turned, pulled open the door, and stepped in. The light was dim, but the atmosphere was pleasant enough. Thick fur rugs sprawled across the wooden floors, and a large cushioned bench sat against one of the walls. A tall, beautiful woman laid atop casually, looking straight at the door, as if expecting someone to walk in at that precise moment. Hello, Scarlet. How is it that you know my name? I know many things, but in particular, I know a lot about you. That shouldn't surprise you much, however. You are, after all, rather famous in these parts. Who are you? Why do you ask a question you already know the answer to? You must be the Forest Witch. Some say you are the daughter of the Red Witch. And do you believe them? No. You believe others have lied to you then? No. Maybe. Well, which is it? The Forest Witch sat up and glared at Scarlet. I believe others may have been misinformed. The Red Witch has only one child, and that child is me. Therefore, if the Forest Witch is the daughter of the Red Witch, it surely cannot be you. The woman stood up and poured a glass of wine into a wooden cup. She seemed to enjoy this type of game, toying with Scarlet as a cat teases a mouse. She turned and took a sip of her wine, savoring the different expressions that swept across Scarlet's face. It is true that you are the daughter of the Red Witch. But might it also be possible that you have been misinformed? A cocky smile snuck out from behind her wine glass, and Scarlet altogether decided that she did not like this forest witch. No, that's not possible. Oh, really? The witch began to circle Scarlet, eyeing her from top to bottom like a hungry raven. She felt a clump of Scarlet's long, curly hair. Hmm. It is a shame your intelligence is not as developed as your pretty face. I really was expecting much more from you, since we are of the same line. Really, Scarlet, you think it's impossible that there may be information from your family kept hidden from you? You claim to be the daughter of the greatest sorceress alive. Yet, you just learned a few days ago that you have magic. And you don't think there might be other things you are never told? Like the fact that you have a twin sister. Sometimes I really wonder how we are from the same line. What? My parents never mentioned a sibling? Why should I believe you? You haven't even told me your name. Let's start with that. Or do you expect me to call you by the witch that you are? Ouch, Scarlet. That hurt. You may call me Illyrith. All right, Illyrith. And how is it that you know so much of me and my family, yet I know nothing of you? If you're so great, I would have heard of you. How do I know you aren't some imposter? Yes, you've had quite a run-in with imposters lately, haven't you? How did you know that? Oh, Scarlet, my dear big sister, so innocent and pure, wanting always to see the good in others, 
You fail to see the world for what it really is. Corrupt! If you don't believe me, use your own magic and look into the past yourself. I don't know the spell. Oh, good heavens, child. You don't need Jasper to follow you around forever, casting spells. You are the one with the magic, not him. There isn't a spell for every possible action in the universe. Surely you know that. Oh my gosh. You simply feel the essence of the motive and will into action. That is true magic. Spells are child's play. Try it yourself. Go back to the day you were born and see for yourself. Scarlet stared blankly, but wondered, perhaps even hoped, that this woman, whoever she was, might in fact have answers to her magic problem. She closed her eyes and began to will with all her might a vision from the past. <sighs> it's working! It's working! I see my mother. She's in the old palace. I've just been born. And she's holding me in a red blanket. And where is your father? He's standing next to her, stroking her hair. It looks like she's in pain. She's screaming. They look surprised. I don't believe it. There's another baby coming. <sighs> Father is wrapping her in a blue blanket. I can't believe this is happening. It already happened. It is true then. I have a twin sister. Oh no, the sun is setting. Mother and father are whispering off to the side. They look frightened. There is darkness near the window. Now they are asleep. It's the black one. He took you. Mother shot up, screaming. Scarlet opened her eyes. Why did our parents never speak of you? Would you have believed them? They did not tell you much of anything, did they? They were protecting me. Yes, you were the fortunate one. Fortunate? You think it's fortunate that I knew nothing of my real life? Where I come from? My own flesh and blood? Well, I knew of you since day one, and what a treat it's been, knowing all these years that half my magic belonged to some clueless girl. What a waste. It's not my fault. I cannot help what our parents did not tell me. Our parents? Ha! Huh. Our parents fed me to the wolves. Yes, you saw our mother cry for me. But what else did she do for me after that day? Did our father ever search for me? Did they give me a guardian for protection? Where were they when I needed them most? Our parents are dead to me. But the Black One wanted me. I am his daughter. He raised me. He cared for me. He made me everything I am. And now, the one thing that holds me back is you. My flesh and blood back to haunt me, prancing around to save the world. But you don't know anything. Alone, our magic is only half as powerful as our mother's. The magic she drank in the vial was divided between us. We are only half as strong as her. But together, 
we can be great. Join me, sister. Come to my side. We can rule the throne as one. Reclaim what is ours at last. Destroy those who have hurt us. We can have everything except love. I have seen what power does to the mind. You think I know nothing of the world. You think I have not seen corruption? I fell in love with a dark king. I have even been tempted by my own pride. I know what power feels like, and I will not join you, not so long as you remain on the Black One's side. My allegiance lies with love. That is the greatest power and fortune I could ever have. Unless you offer me that, you offer nothing, and I in return. So be it. I offer you a chance at greatness. Let it be known you chose death. Stupid girl. No, it is you who chooses death. I am Thordin's daughter as well. We were created from his soul because it was infused with love. But you have been raised by a soulless man, a prince of death. Don't you see, Elaith? You are his pawn. Without his soul, he cannot love you. He cannot love at all. But your family can and does. Something must have prevented our parents from coming for you. I may not have been told a lot, but I know father and mother, and they do not abandon their own. Easy for you to say, you had it all. And now you have a prince. You're going to live in a beautiful palace, have thousands of royal gowns, parties, people who will hang on every word you speak. And of course, you will speak of darkness and hurt. But deep down, as your word echoes beneath those palace walls, into the dirt, and down, down to the roots of darkness, where hurt itself is born, you and your pretty words, with your pretty dress, will be laughed at. I know you are hurting, Elirith, and I know that your life was much harder than mine, and I am truly sorry for that. But I will not apologize for the gifts I was given. It matters not that I was given privilege. What matters is how I choose to use that privilege, and that I use it for good. Pretty dress or not, my heart is pure, and that is the greatest remedy for hurt. Only evil would laugh at a pure heart, and it can laugh away. Well, look who's a courageous little warrior now. You're jealous of me, Elaith. Admit it. Elaith threw her hands forward and used a magical force to slam oh. Scarlet's back against the wall. She marched up and threw her face against Scarlet's. I don't care if you were dead or alive. In fact, I'd rather be rid of you. Go ahead, kill me. Kill the only person who can complete you and your magic. Why do it myself when you'll walk into the Black One's hands for me? Oh, is that your plan? Run home to Daddy Black One and ask if he can spot you a little magic? Do you really think he will let you take his throne, Elaith? He has no interest in helping you. He's using you. Don't be stupid. I'm this close, sister. Elaith grabbed Scarlet's neck and began to choke her. <gasps> Scarlet closed her eyes and willed the treehouse into a roaring fire. Only a spark came, but that was all she needed. Within moments, the room seized in a hot blaze that shot up through the narrow trunk out the top of the tree. Elaith was caught off guard. She turned her head to see the fire, 
and Scarlet threw her knee up into Elaira's stomach. She crumbled to the floor in pain. Tables and chairs were burning all around them, but the two sisters danced around the room in an all-out witch fight. Honestly, it was valuable practice for Scarlet to leave her dependence on spells and rely solely on the instruction Elaira had given her about magic. As it is when any witches or wizards fight, it is difficult for there to be a winner, and the fight seems to go on and on. Two sisters of equal power and equal desire to defeat the other will not go far. The house blazed around them as they cast one greater throw at magic than the other. Ah! 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 The wants your soul! Ah! Your magic! Ah, magic! But if you join with me, ah! You can keep both and rule by my side! Ah! In goodness! Why do you care? But I get out of this! Ah! Your family! At that, the entire tree began to implode on itself. A huge branch crashed in through the wall, and the tree began to tip over. We have to get out of here! Scarlet reached for Elaeroth's hand, but in a sudden impulse of hate, Elaira snatched it away and shoved Scarlet to the side behind the fallen branch. Embers of fire collapsed all around her, trapping Scarlet in a cage of fire. Elaira smirked as she looked for her own way out. The tree shifted and began to fall. Elaira lost her balance and fell as the ground slipped away from her feet. The branch holding Scarlet captive snapped in half and barreled towards Elaira. She watched in terror as it came right for her and plowed a hole into the wall right next to her. <laughs> Scarlet climbed on top of the burning tables and chairs that had piled up together. Elaris' leg had fallen through a side of the wall where she was laying, pinned uh. against the burning debris and the fallen branch. Forget about me, you stupid girl. You have a way out. Save yourself and your pretty dress with your pretty life. Scarlet dodged falling pieces of fire as she slowly crawled her way towards Elaith, gasping in the smoke. <laughs> what good is my pretty dress if I have no one to admire it? Scarlet slid herself carefully along the wall of the tree, which had now become the floor. Holes were visible through the wood, and Scarlet realized for the first time that the tree had actually tipped in the direction of the waterfall and was hanging over the edge. She could see the rocky bluffs and light of the pink rapids rushing beneath them through the holes that burned away the wood. The branch that had bore a hole into the side of the tree pushed through, causing a good portion of the tree to snap open and crash into the water. The break had freed Elaith's foot, but sent her falling towards the rapids. Elaith! Scarlet climbed to the edge where she saw a weak hand hanging on to all that remained of the tree's smaller branches. The leaves had long sizzled off, and what was left of the branches was hardly worth the mention. Yet, it was enough to give her a final grasp at life. Scarlet tore a hole in the bottom of her dress and hooked it onto a shard of wood from the torn trunk that had only been modestly touched by the flames. It barely held her weight, but she hoisted herself just low enough to grab Elaith's arm and pull. Why are you saving me? Elaith reached her other arm and grabbed at what remained of the burning tree. Your family! And I don't take orders from my baby sister! Scarlet's dress began to tear. She looked at Elaith. Fear overcame her. We must combine our magic. Place your mind in my head and will it to safe ground. I'll do the same. The sisters closed their eyes, and as if in slow motion, Scarlet's dress completely tore, and the entire tree slid off the bank into the ravenous waters. But the sisters, linked with their hands and minds, suspended in the air and drift over to a grassy place off on the side. We did it!
it! <laughs> you saved us! <sighs> Apparently I did. But you started it! You should listen to me more often. Stupid girl. <sighs> Elaith flashed a smile. I told you, I don't take orders from my little sis. Scarlet threw her arms around Elaith and hugged her tightly. Oh, good heavens. Ten minutes ago, I was trying to kill you. Let's not get carried away with the love here. I'm still not that fond of you, but I, I'm not going to kill you. What, what, what was that, Elaith? I, I couldn't quite hear you. I don't wish you were dead, Scarlet. But I might still try to kill you. In the nicest way possible, of course. Just don't touch any of my stuff. You do realize it's all burnt. Yes, well, too bad your dress didn't burn with it. I hate to tell you, but red is not your color. Wait, what do you mean red's not my color? Oh, bother. We have to summon Jasper and Coyote. Yes, and I know what Thorodan is planning. We will not be able to penetrate the Black Mountain alone. Wait, so you are willing to work with me? I thought you wanted our parents dead. Well, maybe I need to get some more answers first before I decide who to settle my allegiance with. I will get us to the Black Mountain, but I cannot make any promises as to what happens after that. Fair enough, Elaith. Jasper may not be alive. And Coyote... Jasper is fine. Look. Elaith held up a mirror and showed Jasper tracking through the forest to find Scarlet. Jasper? He's all right. Scarlet, listen to me. If you really believe in this love conquers all thing, then you have to believe that somewhere deep inside of Coyote, there is a seed of love still there that can overcome Thordin's hold on him. I've stared him straight in the eye, Elaith, and he looked right through me. He made me this small. Sometimes I wonder how our star can shine so brightly when his love seems so dead. It's as if I'm not even a memory to him. I am but a weed in his garden, yet that star shines on us both, mocking our love. Okay, that's dramatic, and makes no sense. But Thordin took his soul, not his heart. That has to mean something. Stop your whining and look at the fox. Ilareth shoved the mirror in Scarlet's face. Coyote knows that Jasper is still alive and searching for you. He's gone back to the forest to finish what he started. If you can't get your lover boy to snap out of it, Jasper will be dead. You said that you fell in love with Coyote when his heart was corrupt. Yes, and obviously he fell in love with you. Don't know how that happened. Well, I was a child. That's disgusting. Well, well it, it, it was kind of an enchantment. Another land. We almost died. It was romantic. I don't think I want to know anymore. Sorry. The point is... He found love when all he had was a corrupt heart. He can do it again. He doesn't need his soul. His heart already found the way. All you have to do is wake it up. Remind him of that love. Maybe that's why this star of yours is able to keep shining. No, I, I, I think you might be right. Of course I'm right. We'll need to combine our magic to reach him. Are you ready? Yes. Remember what I told you, Scarlet. Feel the motive in your heart and simply will it to existence. Elaith took Scarlet's hands and both girls closed their eyes as they focused on Coyote. Just
Unbeknownst to Scarlet, Coyote had gone back into the forest to find Jasper and make sure he was dead. Jasper had no idea where Coyote had taken Scarlet. He ran through the forest, searching everywhere for her, but only in vain. Coyote easily spotted Jasper and drew a sword as he walked directly towards him, not even flinching to blink. Jasper stood there, frozen holding his breath. All of a sudden, the sword fell to the ground along with Coyote. He grabbed his chest and began gasping for air. What's happening to you? My heart. I feel... I feel my heart. Coyote looked up at Jasper whose face slowly began to change into his true image. I was about to kill you, Jasper. Forgive me. Coyote looked up into the eyes of his faithful servant, who stood trembling. What's happening? How is this possible? It's Scarlet's magic. Her love has saved me. Now I must save her. Jasper's eyes grew fiery. Where is she? What have you done? Coyote stood up. Outside this wood, there is a clearing right before the valley. I shrunk her. She is no more than the size of a fairy. The smallest insect would eat her alive. Jasper, she is in grave danger. You have got to be the worst boyfriend of the century. Let's go then. The two men took off and ran like gallant knights through the forest. Nothing could stand in their way. They charged forward with a godly force that no other could match. They ran with a love, a special love they each possessed for Scarlet in their own way. Meanwhile, the sisters had united their magic and returned to their usual size. They stood amongst the enchanted garden where the pink dolphin rabbits had played with Scarlet not very long before. Elayrith pulled the mirror out of a pocket on her dress and showed Scarlet a vision of Coyote dropping his sword and joining forces with Jasper. Coyote! Scarlet grabbed the mirror and touched the image of her beloved with her fingers. Elayrith, it worked! Her magic worked! It looks like they're coming to rescue me. They must believe I'm still where Coyote left me. We must go to the clearing to meet them. Not so fast. Elayrith grabbed the golden mirror from Scarlet's hands and stared into it. Look. She showed Scarlet an image of the owl following the two men through the forest. The owl. The black one will see what we've done. Not unless I have something to do about it. Elayrith whistled and instantly an enormous shadow flew over the two girls. It was a condor, with feathers black as night. It was beyond the size of any bird Scarlet had seen in her life, easily the size and weight of a well-fed man. Brinley, there you are, big boy. The enormous, vicious-looking creature swooped down and perched on the ground in front of Elaerith. Scarlet's jaw dropped. That's yours? Elaerith just looked at Scarlet and winked. 
You're a hungry big boy, aren't you, Brindley? <coughs> Mama knows. Why don't you go see if you can find yourself a nice owl to eat, huh? Go on now. The bird flapped its unearthly wings and took off towards the Forest of Shadows. Illyrith looked at Scarlet. He does whatever I tell him. I see you really took the whole forest witch thing to heart. Who names the pet Condor Brinley? That's as bad as naming a sea serpent Fluffy. Hey, I know a sea serpent named Fluffy. She lives in the lake not far from here. Oh, that wretched glass thing was Fluffy? I take it you two have met. Let me just say, Fluffy is not so Fluffy anymore. By the way, that was a brilliant way to handle the owl. Ilarith looked over at Scarlet. So was what you did at the treehouse. I never did thank you for saving my life. Well, I guess we're even now. Just tell me one thing, though. How will Brindley know which owl to hunt? Oh, trust me, he knows. The two sisters continued towards the clearing where Coyote had placed the shrinking spell on Scarlet. So tell me more about Coyote. What do you mean? Any man my sister cheats death for a dozen times over better be worth it. Oh, so you're all protective over me now. Whatever happened to you, we'll see what happens at the Dark Mountain. Well, I'm still not making any promises. I can at least inquire into my sister's love life, can I not? After all, there aren't exactly knights in shining armor breaking down my door. I'll admit, life has been a little boring as a hermit. Well, Coyote is a gentleman and a man of honor. Don't expect any wild stories. No, but I'll expect one hell of a kiss when I see the two of you together. Oh, stop it! Oh, look at you getting all blushy. Your face is as red as your dress. Ilayrith and Scarlet walked through the bushes towards the rocky field overlooking the dark mountain. They stood at the top of the hill, gazing down at a valley. It was a barren wasteland of sharp stones and pale sand. A thundering roar could be heard in the distance as lightning shot out from the top of the mountain. Black clouds swirled around the mountain as if the pits of hell itself had opened up and stirred them. The mountain itself seemed alive as hundreds of soulless men and women bustled around preparing for battle. No plant life grew on the mountain. It was a steep slope of black volcanic rock molded into the shape of a castle near the top. An eerie moat surrounded it and waters glowed with a murky greenish color from the lifeless souls that floated aimlessly through the water. The mountain was rooted deep under the earth, far below what was visible on the surface. It looked well established and heavy, like it had been there for centuries, collecting up every slithering creature possible and storing it in a dark lair somewhere deep beneath the surface. Scarlet! Oh, thank God you're all right! Scarlet turned to find her beloved coyote running towards her with his arms outstretched. His face shone a mixture of sheer relief and overwhelming joy. He threw his arms around her and pulled her to the air as he spun around. I thought I would never see you again! Scarlet kissed him all over his face, the two of them completely ignoring the others. I love you so much. We have to get your soul back. I know. I love you too. Jasper looked inquisitively at Alayrith. Um, sorry to interrupt. I was not expecting company. Don't mind my asking. Who are you? At this point, Scarlet and Coyote snapped to attention. Oh. My name is Alayrith. Uh, Jasper, Coyote. This is my twin sister. What? You're an only child, Scarlet. This is an imposter. Coyote reached for his sword and quickly drew it at Alayrith. Gentlemen, please do not harm her. Let me explain. I used my own magic and saw a vision from the day I was born. Alayrith speaks the truth. She is my twin sister. 
How is this possible? How do I not know of you? I was there the day Scarlet was born. Elaith glared at Jasper. We were hoping you could explain it to us. It seems my royal parents and their trusty servant were rather passive when the Black One kidnapped me. But don't worry, I've come to terms with it. The Black One actually wanted me, which is a lot more than I can say for my parents. Or you. No, no, something is not right. I'll say. Coyote put his sword back into its sheath. When I was working for the Black One, I recall them saying how everything was moving according to plan. That you, the Lairith, were right where he wanted you to be. And even the idea for me to shrink Scarlet so that she could conveniently find you in your treehouse. That was all part of his plan. Don't you see? He planned all of this. He even extracted any memory of Lairith from those who might have searched for her. He wanted your meeting with Scarlet to be on his terms. I don't understand. Think about it. Don't you think it's rather convenient that your mother had twins? What? No one can control that. Or can they? He has powerful magic. If all the Red Witch's magic had gone to one person, he could never stand a chance against breaking that. But if only half her magic were in two separate people, he might actually stand a chance. Wait, are you saying he kidnapped me to keep us apart so that our magic would not be complete? Yes. That's why I've had so many magic problems. And he wanted us to meet at this time, on his terms. That's why he had me recite the shrinking spell. He knew it would lead Scarlet to Elaith. And how to ensure that two long-lost sisters would become enemies, rather than friends at their moment of meeting, make them opposites. If Scarlet's entire world is built on love, make Elaith's entire world built on hate. Jasper looked up at Elaith, who stared back at him. It makes perfect sense. He blocked the memories of you from your parents and me to ensure that we would never go looking for you, and that I would think you had abandoned me. I hated them all these years. Jasper kept his eyes locked on Elaith's. He is a monster and must be stopped, no matter the price. Elaris large condor swooped down with a dead owl in his mouth. Elaris blinked and turned. Brinley, you found dinner. Good boy. The enormous beast of a bird threw its head up in the air and flapped its wings as if it were a small, excited child. It then started gnashing away at the owl in a frenzied feast. The others stood gaping. I guess we don't have to worry about the Black One watching us anymore. We should make a fire, eat, and rest for the night. Can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually hungry after watching Brindley eat. Right then. Elaith turned to Scarlet. Shall we work together and put on a grand feast? We can make a small fire behind those rocks over by that hill. It will keep us more hidden. Scarlet stood up. Let's do it. They took hands and pressed their foreheads together while closing their eyes. Magnum sethuna manducare calorum ificium venedita. The blood pulsated through the veins of the two sisters, and at once a small fire was set ablaze behind a large pile of nearby stones, with a small pig skewered above the fire, looking deliciously well done. A couple baskets of fruits and berries sat nearby, with a loaf of bread and some cheese placed atop. Well done, ladies! Jasper walked over and looked into two clay jars that stood near the baskets, filled to the brim. Ooh, wine! That's fancy! Elaith grinned sheepishly. <laughs> what else are you going to do in a treehouse your whole life? Jasper smiled and looked at her. Life should be celebrated. Elaith, you recited a spell. I thought you said spells were child's play. Yes, well. She looked into Scarlet's eyes. Maybe it's time I started learning new things. 
Scarlet's face broke into a beaming smile, as did Alaris. Come on, everyone. We feast now, for tomorrow we will need all the strength this night can provide us. Coyote started to carve the pig and distribute the food. It was a spectacular feast that was much needed, considering most of them had been on the run with little to eat for several days now. Despite the darkness of what was to follow the next morning, the group managed to push aside the fear and dread of what was waiting for them the next day and simply enjoy the moment for what it was. That is, all of them except Alayrith. She sat quietly eating her meal and then got up to tend to Brinley who was nearby. Jasper wanted to give Scarlet and Coyote some time alone, so he followed Alayrith and watched as she stroked the enormous beast as if it was a tiny pet rabbit. He could still see Scarlet and Coyote in the nearby distance. So, who names a condor Brinley? Alayrith looked up but kept stroking the bird. Scarlet asked the same question. I suppose you think I should have named him something fearsome, like Althalos or Sarak. Jasper flashed a smile. Well, it's not a bad name. It's just a surprise when you hear it and think one thing, but then lay eyes on it and study it more. You see something entirely different. Alayrith looked up, sensing that Jasper had been referring to more than just the bird. Well, we all have different sides, don't we? He may be a hideous predator on the outside. Sorry, boy. But on the inside, he just wants to be loved like all of us do. Elaith sat down on a nearby rock. Jasper followed and sat next to her. It's hard to figure out our place in the world sometimes, especially when much is expected. I think in some way we all put on a face of a condor when deep inside we feel like a sheep. I don't know what to feel anymore. All this time I thought my parents didn't love me. I thought they discarded me. And now I'm starting to realize that the only person I thought had loved me was actually the cause of my pain and that I spent most of my life hating people who never even knew I existed. I almost killed the only person who ever showed me decency. I behaved like a real witch to Scarlet. She risked her life to save me. I've never felt this much humility in one day. <laughs> that must mean your conscience is alive and well then. Maybe you aren't such a witch after all. And... Maybe in time you will learn that Scarlet is not the only person capable of treating you with decency. Jasper stared at the ground, and then looked up. Elayrith looked intently at Jasper, almost holding her breath as she waited to hear his next words. Elayrith, you were not created to be discarded. You were created from love, in order to be loved. This is where you are wrong. Now I know that the Black One used his dark magic to make my mother have twins. I was only created to be used as a buffer for my mother's magic. I was never meant to be loved. Only used. No, Ilerith. I knew your mother quite well. It was her magic that infused Thord and Soul with goodness and put it into your father Xavier's body. That kind of love, that magic, is not capable of creating rubbish. It doesn't matter how your twinship came to be. You are still created from love to be loved. You have a purpose in this world. You deserve to be treated with dignity, always. You're so Beautiful. Elayrith held her breath. She stood quietly as she tried to comprehend the words just spoken to her. Maybe it was the genuine tone of Jasper's voice and the sweet, boyish look about him, but Elayrith felt as though she might begin to cry for some reason. You think I'm beautiful? Oh, I can't believe I said that. It was not my place. I'm so sorry. No, it's fine. No one has 
ever said anything so sweet and wholesome to me before. Jasper rubbed the back of his neck and looked uncomfortable. I really should get back to the others. I'll be taking first watch tonight. Oh, of course. I'll just give Brindley some water and prepare him for the night. All right. And, um, I can take second watch. Jasper looked down. The hint of a smile faded as quickly as it crept in. Right then. Better hurry and get some sleep. The four travelers slept soundly as one would expect with a feast as magnificent as they had eaten. Even Brinley sat content with his beak curled under his enormous wing. Each of them took turns on night watch, even Prince Coyote, who insisted not to be given special treatment. In fact, he decided silently to take on a longer shift. No one could have realized this gesture since they were all asleep. But he knew, and he preferred it that way. There seemed to be nothing he could sacrifice of himself that would take away the guilt that burdened him so heavily. He sat there in the darkness while the others slept. The silence of his solitude swallowed him up as he contemplated his entire life. Everything rushed past him in a blur. He remembered the instance when he first coveted the crown of his father. His entire childhood had been nothing but a privileged, indulgent life, yet nothing had ever brought him satisfaction. As he grew older, his mind became consumed with one thing, his father's crown. It was not long before he began to loathe his father. The king soon became to the young prince as just a man who happened to be in the way of what he desired most. Soon he could not even bear the sight of his mother. His mind was sick. He did not think of her as the person who gave him life. A spectacular one at that. Instead, she became to him as a person who sided with his father. A betrayer. Another obstacle in the way of his crown. Patience had never been a virtue of Coyote's. How could it have been when everything he desired was given him at the snap of a finger? He could not even bear to wait until he became of age and took his father's crown naturally. He convinced himself that he actually needed the crown, and that the crown needed him. It was like a fire within him that could never be extinguished. He had heard long ago about the dark myth of the Dragon King, the Black One, once a man by the name of King Thoradin, but now a monster. He had heard all about the legend of the mystical water of life and the two brothers who would both essentially succumb to their death over that water. He heard the legend a hundred times by his mistress when he was a young child. He never believed they were real, until one day. He had been outside in the castle gardens, alone with his dark thoughts, and all of a sudden it was as if his thoughts became real. He heard his own voice, but it was really the voice of the Black One who had been lurking in the shadows. He filled Coyote's mind with promises of power and even greater nobility, and he offered Coyote the service of himself as Dragon King to remove those who were in his way. Coyote had been so consumed by his lust for his father's crown that he did not even think about the price that this bargain would acquire. It took some time for Coyote to realize exactly what he had done to himself. The Black One did exactly what he was asked. The touch of darkness easily took away Coyote's parents, and in an instant, he had become everything he wanted. The King and Queen became shells of life for the Black One, bodies without souls, to establish his legion for the great battle that now awaited Coyote in that mountain. Very soon, the Black One grew impatient with Coyote and began to demand more of him, access to more people, more souls. Coyote's desire for power continued to burn like a relentless flame. The dragon gave him power, an ability to rule with magical force. 
in exchange for souls. Little did he realize that the more power he believed he had, the less in control he actually was. He soon became a slave to his own power and the whim of the dragon. Eventually, time had come for the Black One to collect his price, Coyote's own soul. By that point, Coyote had already fallen in love with Scarlet and had started to change his ways. This only made the regret of the offering even worse, which was precisely what the Black One had wanted. The wind was cold, yet none of the others asleep on the ground seemed bothered. Coyote could barely stand to look at the dark mountain because it filled his heart with deep shame. He could not stand to think that he had wasted so many years of his life in darkness. How could he have ever thought that his father's crown or deal with the dragon would satisfy? He looked down at Scarlet, fast asleep with her back against a large stone. Her love had been the only thing that ever truly satisfied him. Her heart was so pure. It had never even tasted darkness the way his had. How could she love a man like him? What could he possibly offer her? How could he trust himself that he would not cause harm to her again like he already had? A horrible, dark thought crept into his mind and made him almost sick to his stomach, but it lingered with a wretched stench. There was nothing he could ever do to repair the damage done. He would never really be able to trust himself again. At the first taste of power, what if he abused his privilege and failed everyone again? What if he failed Scarlet? It was too easy to let her down. Or worse, what if he tainted the purity of her heart or caused it pain in some way? There was no way he could guarantee she would ever be safe from him. A cold sweat came over him. He could never be the husband she needed. The duty of a husband felt even more daunting than his duty as king. His heart could never be pure like Scarlet's. He was destined to fail. Why drag Scarlet into his dark plunder? She didn't deserve that. He looked down at the engagement ring on her finger. Jasper was right. He was the worst boyfriend of the century. What are you thinking, friend? The startled coyote turned to see Jasper standing behind him. What are you doing awake? Something felt wrong. I had a dream that you had fallen off a cliff, and Scarlet was holding on to you. But just when the moment came that she was about to pull you up, you let go. Then I woke up and saw the most peculiar expressions on your face. It was then that I realized that it was not a dream I was having but rather the echoes of your heart beating in my mind. My heart is not your business. You forget that I am Scarlet's guardian. If she is entwined in your fate, then a mere whisker on your face is my business. Please, friend, talk to me. We are all facing our deepest anxieties on this journey. It is understandable if you are afraid. You wouldn't understand. Your entire life has been pure, like Scarlet's. You have never tasted evil the way I have. You do not carry the regret and shame that I do. How can I ever look Scarlet in the eye again, and worse, vow to her on our wedding day that I will never cause her pain again? I don't trust myself, and she is naive to trust me. She is better off without me. You all are. You said it yourself, I am the worst boyfriend of the century. I am the worst man. I should be the one to face Lord, and I will sacrifice myself for the sake of everyone. My life is not worth saving. In that moment, Jasper did something unexpected. With a hand as quick as a blink, he reached over and grabbed Coyote's dagger right off his waist and pressed it up against Coyote's neck, grabbing his tunic forcefully with his fist. <laughs> If you so much as think of doing that, I will kill you myself. Coyote blinked. He was stunned. Never in his life had he seen Jasper pull a move like that. Jasper, the shy, scrawny young boy who always seemed so academic, had just become a man. 
Jasper pressed the dagger harder into Coyote's neck, <sighs> but took care not to break the skin. How could you ever do to Scarlet what Elaira thought her parents did to her? Look what that created! If you really think that abandoning the woman you love is a noble gesture, then not only are you the worst boyfriend of the century, you are also a coward. Scarlet has faced death twenty times over for you. She has fought demons for you. She could have walked away at any time, but didn't. Even when that bloody star kept shining and she had no proof that this entire plan was not just a journey to her own demise, even now nothing is a guarantee. It is time now that you fought the demons within yourself for her. Love is bigger than romance. If you think you will wake up every day smelling roses or that you could possibly be the perfect husband for her, then you are the naive one. Neither of you will ever be perfect. But love is a battle, and you better be man enough to at least fight. Jasper pulled the blade away and pushed Coyote as he let go of his grip on Coyote's tunic. He tossed the dagger on the ground at Coyote's feet as he walked back towards the others. Coyote stood, frozen, staring at the dark mountain. He looked down at the dagger and then up at the mountain. He stooped down and picked up the dagger. Jasper was right. Nothing was guaranteed, except the fact that he truly loved Scarlet, and that at least today, darkness would not win. Dawn began to break, yet it was still dark. It was still black as night, with a cool wind when the travelers awoke. The merriment of the night before had already become a distant memory, replaced by an eerie silence. Each of them instinctively knew of the horrors that awaited them. They packed up quickly. Smoke from the fire still hanging low in the air around them, Coyote stood up and spoke to the group in a low voice. We stick to the plan. I will enter the castle first, pretending to be my old self. We must make him believe that he still has the upper hand and catch him off guard. Elaireth will be waiting to take both of you in as prisoners on the Black One's queue. Once we have his audience, we strike. Now. We will all need weapons, but remember, only strike if you absolutely must. The legions against us know not what they do." A look of shame washed over his face, but he quickly pushed it away and looked back at the others. It is the Black One we must target, and no one else. Only my dagger has the power to kill him when he is in the dragon form, but we have no idea what we face in there. The Black One often goes invisible, so bear that in mind. Whatever happens today, you are already heroes of Eldorotta. Elirith, are you and Scarlet ready? Yes, we are, my lord. Elirith nodded her head as she gave Scarlet and Jasper swords of their own. It was decided that Brinley should be dismissed. He was too large, for one thing, and made an obvious connection to the dead owl. Besides, Elaerith could always call for him if really needed. The travelers set out on foot. They walked slowly, carefully, silently, through the barren wasteland of sharp rocks and boulders towards the dark mountain. The distant thunder grew louder, along with the dread they all carried as they approached the Valley of Darkness. Look! Scarlet stared down at her feet. A tiny trickle of water pushed its way through the stones. Jasper stepped over and looked down. Don't touch! He stepped back, and right as he did, the water started to glow with an eerie greenish-blue color as it began to pool into a little valley. The water of souls! Scarlet swallowed hard. She looked up and realized they were almost at the moat that surrounded the castle. Watch your step, everyone. Elaerith's eyes glared at the mountain as she forged onward with determination. They came to a steep, rocky cliff that curved backwards slightly and formed the top of a sharp ravine to the moat. Scarlet looked up in awe and fear. There is a gate that cuts through this cliff. It is guarded by a troll. From now on, I do the talking. 
Coyote pointed to a massive wooden drawbridge built into the cliff, guarded by a large creature. It towered over them and had flesh that was rough and thick like the rocky cliff it guarded. Its skin was a grayish tan with long strands of scraggly hairs that grew around its hideous nose and armpits. It looked like it had the strength to crush an ancient tree with the slightest tap of its oversized hands. Its eyes glared in evil stare as the group approached it. What is your business with the master? Coyote looked at the group and snarled. I have brought prisoners. The troll snapped its head toward the group and growled at them. <sighs> its hot breath reeked with an unthinkable rot and black saliva splattered out of its mouth. Very well. The troll pulled a massive rope that was hanging near the top of the cliff, and slowly the enormous wooden drawbridge began to lower down towards the castle. Coyote played his part well and ordered the group to cross the bridge. A part of him felt that the roll came back all too easily. He was surprised how easy it was to return to a person he no longer was. Or was he? The dark mountain was strangely inviting and all too familiar. He ordered the group to move more quickly as he led them into the castle's entrance. Scarlet looked at him with a distrustful eye. He blinked and turned his gaze to the castle. This was war. They approached the end of the bridge. Another guard stood at the massive door into the castle. Let us enter. The master waits for his prisoners. The guard glared at the travelers with bright yellow eyes. He made a low growl and opened the gate. Coyote glared at the others with the same look in his eyes. Follow me. They marched in, and instantly darkness surrounded them. It was suffocating, even though the ceiling reached to the very top of the mountain. It felt like they were in the underworld. Coyote led them through a labyrinth of halls, up a winding staircase to the very top of the mountain, where the Black One sat in a small room with archways to the outdoors. The room was garnished with nothing, only a tall, black throne. Scarlet's stomach lurched, for she had never actually seen the Black One face to face. She felt as if she was looking into the eyes of the Devil himself. He grinned. Well, if it isn't my two daughters, finally come to visit their old man. Do you like the view? He gestured his arm towards one of the archways. Scarlet glared at him. I see you met your long-lost sister. Oh, it's going to be such a party with the whole family reunited. Let's get Mummy and Daddy up, shall we? The Black One snapped his fingers, and Coyote left to bring Scarlet and Alaric's parents. Father... Yes, Daddy and I had a little meet and greet earlier. But don't worry, I took very good care of him. After all, he is carrying my soul. The Black One stood up. He wore a long black cape lined with black fur. Coyote walked into the room holding a chain with Scarlet's parents cuffed at the wrist. Go ahead and unlock it. They have nowhere to run now. Coyote reached for the key held out by the Black One, who yanked it and pulled Coyote in close. You better not have gone soft on me. No, Master. I am yours. Coyote took the key and released the two prisoners. Rose, I'd like to introduce you and your husband to the daughter you never knew you had. Please meet Elaerith. She is Scarlet's twin sister. You would not recall who she is because, well, because I took care of that quite nicely, I might not. Elaerith stood frozen, 
questioning the many mixed emotions she had surging through her body in that moment. Her mother, the Red Witch, had a blank expression on her face. The Black One still controlled her, but Alayrith's father was not under his control and walked up to her with a puzzled expression on his face. I don't understand. Scarlet is our daughter. We only have one child. Father. Scarlet ran up to him and threw her arms around him. You only have one child, because that's all I allowed you to remember. Here, try this on for size. The black one held out his palm and blew on it. All of a sudden, Jasper and Scarlet's parents became filled with memories of Elaris' birth and the pain of losing her. So it's true, then. You took away their memories of me. They did not abandon me. They did not know of me. Yes. Are you disappointed? I made you great. You were better off without them getting in the way. Look at how your pathetic sister turned out. Elaith, I am so sorry. I had no idea. You must have hated us all these years. I don't blame you if you did. I would have searched day and night for you if I had only known. I love you, Elaith. Her eyes welled with tears, but she did not lose sight of the plan. She forced herself to utter the following words. I hate you. I never want to see you again. I am the Black One's daughter now. You are free of me. Elaris stepped back and stood next to Coyote and the Red Witch. You know, I'm getting a little bored. I think we've had enough family reunion. The Black One stared directly at Scarlet. In that moment, a dozen goblins stepped up and stood guard around each archway of the throne room. They showed their sharp teeth and tapped their long, black nails together as they waited for their cue to fight. Scarlet lowered her gaze and slowly drew her sword. The Black One snapped his fingers and instantly vanished. The goblins moved in and began to attack. Jasper and Scarlet had their swords drawn and courageously began fighting the goblins. Coyote looked around to find the Black One. He knew that the only way to end this battle would be to kill the Black One once and for all. Scarlet never realized how battle-ready she actually was. Only a few weeks ago, she had known nothing about her origin, and now she was bravely slicing heads off goblins and dodging their grotesque claws. Just when she began to feel like they were making headway, she plunged her sword forward, but the hand of the goblin was quicker than hers and caught her wrist. It was as if she had hit a wall. In fact, everyone seemed to stop. The goblin smiled at her as his face turned into that of the black one. Scarlet's sword fell to the ground. It had happened. Your soul is mine! Scarlet's body collapsed to the floor, and her soul appeared like a mist that melted out of her and flow toward the open archways and down into the murky moat below. Elaith, darling, why do I not feel her magic? She has half the strength like you, and yet I feel nothing. Elaith calmly stepped forward, holding a vial of purple liquid in her hand. Looking for this? The black one turned around and stared at her, confused. Scarlet put together this little recipe in preparation for the party. You might call this a Scarlet cocktail. You'll have to get through me to get to her magic. The black one threw a magical force against Alayrith and threw her entire body through the air and slammed her against one of the pillars choking her with an invisible force. He twisted his wrist, and Alayrith fell to the floor, coughing and sputtering. He marched closer. Coyote looked at him, and then over his shoulder. The moat was a long way down, 
but he didn't care. He turned and jumped off the mountain into the glowing water. Jasper held his breath, but then remembered that Coyote had already lost his soul to the Black One, which meant that he was essentially immune to the water's dark magic. The goblins yanked Jasper's sword out of his hand and held him by the shoulders, digging their black nails into his skin. Jasper watched, horrified, as the Black One fought a magical battle with Ilarith. She looked up and threw her hands in the air, causing the Black One to fly through the air as well and slam into an opposing pillar. You never really loved me. In fact, you actually caused me a lot of pain. I made you great! You did, and for that I'm eternally grateful. It was everything you taught me that helped me plan this all out with my sister. And I took great pleasure in knowing that after today, I will not think of you for the rest of my life. Traitor! I gave you everything! You never gave me love, so why should I give you her magic? The Black One pulled Alayrith to the center of the room where the throne sat, and with a flick of his wrist, she was brought upright, as stiff as a board. He then swooshed his fingers backward, and she fell straight back, still stiff and paralyzed, but her feet were anchored to the center of the room as she hovered in the air. The Black One directed her body to circle the room round and round, faster and faster. Jasper held his breath. Meanwhile, Coyote had been swimming through the moat and found Scarlet's soul. He pulled it out of the water. Alareth had seen him dive off the mountain and knew exactly what he had been doing. She whistled, and after a few moments, the enormous Brinley flew out of nowhere and began circling the tower. All Alareth had to do was whisper Coyote's name, and Brinley seemed to know exactly what to do. He swooped down to the moat where Coyote was still swimming through the water. Brinley took his large talons and grabbed Coyote by the shoulders with Scarlet Soul cradled in his arms. He flew to the top of the mountain, Elareth laying sideways and being slammed in every direction by the Black One's magical forces could see everything, but unbeknownst to the Black One, he was too distracted with the battle at hand. Elareth was smart though calculating. She knew exactly what she was doing. She just had to wait for the right moment. All right, I surrender. You want the magic? Come and get it. And with that, she drank the vial moments before Brinley dropped Coyote onto the ground. The black one lunged to touch her, but in the split second before his skin touched hers, she drew out all the magic, now complete, and infused Scarlet Soul back into her body, just like her mother had with Thordon and Xavier. Moments before Elareth's body fell to the floor, she threw Scarlet the vial to capture the magic. The vial flew through the air but missed Scarlet and smashed against Jasper. All the magic absorbed into his skin. Elareth's body fell to the floor as her soul spilled out and moved towards the edge. Scarlet breathed in. <sighs> a look of surprise washed over Jasper, but he wasted no time. He had studied magic long enough and knew exactly what to do. He flung the goblins off his body. The black one was startled for just a moment, but that was all it took. Coyote threw his dagger towards Scarlet, and she caught it with a little help from Jasper's magic. She turned and threw the dagger right into the Black One's chest. He instantly collapsed, and the whole mountain shook. The pillars at the archways began to break apart, and the entire mountain seemed as if it was about to tip over. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Pieces of rock began flying through the air as the ground shifted. Everyone shrieked and reached out for something to hold as they began to slide off towards the edge. Goblins flew off and tumbled down into the water. Elareth had still not regained control of her own self and slid quickly to the edge. Fortunately for her, Brinley was a faithful bird and had not flown away. It swooped under the falling rubble and caught her, along with both her parents. 
It grabbed Scarlet and Coyote each by a talon and picked up Jasper with its sharp beak. The black one crashed into the water as the entire mountain imploded on top of him. He was finally dead. Brinley landed in a nearby area. Scarlet stood up. The moat looked like a white, misty haze was being drawn up from it, as souls were being released from their prison and rejoining with the bodies that the Black One had been commanding. Three souls floated over to them, Coyotes, Elaeriths, and her mothers. But one soul moved in the opposite direction, her father. Father! She rushed to kneel by his side. He was gasping for air, and she remembered what the Grey Witch had told her long ago. Once a body dies, its soul must pass through the door of the dead. Since her father was actually Prince Xavier, serving as a vessel for his brother Thoradin, the Black One's soul, it was still attached in a spiritual kind of way to the Black One. So when the Black One died, it meant his soul would also have to leave this earth, no matter where it resided. Elaerith breathed and awoke as her soul came within her again. She opened her eyes to see Scarlet crying over their father. No! Father! Elaerith lunged forward and took his hand. I am so sorry, Father. I never meant those words. I have forgiven you. I know. I know. Uh, it is I who was sorry. I could not be the father you needed. <sighs> I am so proud of you, Elaerith. I will, I will always love you. And I you, father. In that moment, his soul lifted from his body, and the Red Witch also breathed life again. Elaerith turned to Jasper. Save him! Infuse my father with the magic! It was done once before, and it can be done again! No! The Red Witch laid her hand upon Elaerith's. Elaerith, my love, it is unnatural to prolong this any more. It is time we let him go. No! No! <laughs> Elaerith buried her face into her father's chest, and silent tears flowed down the cheeks of the Red Witch and Scarlet. The two sisters watched as their father's soul lifted from his body. Over in the sky, a portal opened, and they could see the Black Witch standing in a long, flowing black gown, holding open the gate and patiently waiting for their father. The look on her face was pure and sweet, as if she was welcoming someone home to a banquet after a long journey. She smiled at him and reached out her hand to take his. At the moment they touched, a light burst forth from behind the gate, and nothing else could be seen. It was so bright that a person had to look away slightly because it would be too painful to stare directly at the light. But then, once you turned back to look again, there was nothing more to see, and the glimpse that had just been revealed before you became, once again, hidden behind a veil. Scarlet turned to her mother. She had not seen Scarlet since she was a small child, and now she was a grown woman, engaged to her own prince. Her mother looked as beautiful as the day Scarlet remembered losing her. She turned to Scarlet, tears welling in her eyes. Scott, my two girls. She burst into tears and threw her arms around both of them. Jasper and Coyote sat quietly, small tears sliding down both of their cheeks. Coyote turned to Jasper and looked him in the eye. I don't even have the words to tell you how grateful I am for you. Don't mention it. Whoa! Coyote threw his arms around Jasper and hugged him so tight. He then pulled back, both men looking slightly sheepish and wiping their eyes quickly. 
Ahem. No one ever has to know about that, my lord. Except what we ladies saw, that underneath these brave men of ours lies softies. Scarlet's face broke out in a playful grin as she grabbed Coyote's hand. He pulled her in and kissed her deeply. The Red Witch turned to the others. Well then, I did not realize she was in love with the prince. It appears I've been away a few years too long. Scarlet and Coyote are engaged. They are soon to be married. It sounds like I will have much catching up to do with both my daughters. And Jasper, my faithful Jasper, you have not aged a single day since I last remember you. Well, your sister's magic fulfilled its purpose. The Red Witch held out her hand and grasped Jasper's hand tightly. She looked solemnly into his eyes. Thank you, my friend. You kept your promise. It has always been an honor to serve you, my lady. Elaerith looked at him and grinned slightly. He looked at her and then quickly down at his hands. A glimmer of a grin washed over his face in a near fraction of a second. But it was long enough for the Red Witch to take notice and smile to herself. Brinley! Everyone looked up to see Brinley flapping his enormous wings as he swooped in low to deliver two people in his talons, King Belchalot and the Queen. Father! Mother! Coyote scrambled to his feet and went to go hug his parents but stopped himself abruptly. A wave of shame and guilt washed over him, and instead, he fell to his knees. He kissed the feet of his parents. Forgive me, father, mother. I have betrayed the both of you, and do not even deserve to be called your son, let alone wear the crown of our family's honor. I have brought shame to our family name and pain to you and many other lives. I deserve to be your slave and work hard for a servant's wage in the castle. I pledge my life in your service. Forgive me. Scarlet had never before seen the king and queen up close. They had distinguished faces, but warm ones. Coyote's father and mother smiled warmly. Get up, my son. Coyote did as he was told. His father and mother both kissed the top of his head and looked into his eyes. All is forgiven. You had lost your heart, but finally found it. For this, we celebrate. You will always be our son, and we will never stop loving you. A new day is beginning. And we will celebrate your true coronation and return to our family with a great banquet. Coyote wept and hugged both his parents. Coyote then turned to look at Scarlet. Father, mother, this woman helped me find my heart. I'd like you to meet my fiancé, Lady Scarlet. And at that, a lot of laughter. Tears and joy resounded through the valley that had once been a barren wasteland of evil. Now it was already growing with green grass and wild white daisies. The mountain and all its evil parts had crumbled away into nothing. The Forest of Shadows still existed because there will always exist a desire for pride in the hearts of men. But, at least for now, the forest seemed a little less dark after Coyote and Alayrith had made amends with their parents. Many of the trees that grew up out of terrible crimes and injustice fell over and withered away. This happens in the Forest of Shadows, when the roots of a crime can no longer keep hold of the tree once that crime has been forgiven and all made right again. Trees that had been thriving on darkness no longer have anything to give them life. After Brinley had carried them all home, 
A grand feast was ordered to properly celebrate the return of all the citizens who had been captured by the Black One, and most especially to celebrate the return of Prince Coyote and his parents. A proper burial was also ordered for Scarlet and Alayrith's father, with a statue and an engraving to honor his heroic deeds. Prince Coyote and Scarlet agreed to combine his coronation with their wedding ceremony, and scheduled it for the following morning. My lord, Jasper looked up at Coyote as he was helping him decide which cape to wear for the ceremony. I do not wish to take away from this moment, but may I remind you that I still have the Red Witch's magic? I am not sure that I am the right person to bear such a magical treasure. Perhaps we ought to pay a visit to the old ruins that enshroud the water of life. It is there we may speak to the guardian witches and seek their counsel on my predicament. You are most right, Jasper. Let us address this issue at once. Prepare the horses. I was thinking, sire, we might travel by air again? That is perfect. Let Scarlet and I ride Adelia. She has not left Scarlet's side since our return. Yes, my lord. Coyote and Scarlet flew on the back of Adelia, who was delighted to be together with her masters once again. Ilareth, Jasper, and the Red Witch rode on Brinley. They all had some connection with the old ruins, but the most nostalgic of them all was the Red Witch, who had lived most of her life guarding the magical waters. She had given up her position as Guardian Witch, along with her immortality, when she had infused Thordon's soul into Xavier's body in order to safeguard it and protect Eldalata from even greater treachery that the Black One could have wielded with it. The group approached the ruins cautiously, though they no longer had reason to fear. Scarlet remembered how strange it seemed to find a pond and forest inside the walls of a castle. Somehow, it didn't feel as strange this time. They approached the tall stairs and made their way inside the ruins. To their surprise, an old man was standing on the bank of the pond, running his hand through the water. What surprised Scarlet was that he seemed entirely unaffected by the magical properties of the water. He looked up when they arrived, but said nothing. There was a most astounding presence about him. His blue eyes twinkled with a warmth and familiarity, yet Scarlet had never met the man before. He smiled at them. Not a word was spoken, but they all instinctively felt an inexplicable urge to look away from his eyes and lower their heads. Every one of them seemed to recall moments in their lives hidden away that for whatever reason or another was something they had regretted. It was an odd feeling, kind of like an awakening or an awareness that neither of them had ever felt, even after the death of the Black One. Although it was a bit painful at first, it also felt like a relief, like the kind of feeling one has when a sliver is pulled out. He was a kind man, and told them that he goes by many names to many people but that in Eldolata, most know of him as the Elder. Scarlet immediately remembered where she had first heard that name. It was from the Grey Witch, who had met her at this very spot, and explained the story of the Fallen King. She recalled the words of the Grey Witch. We are powerful, yet even our combined power is nothing compared to the Elder who is the greatest sorcerer to ever exist. Scarlet had not understood what the Grey Witch had meant at that time, but there was no way she could have. And even if the Grey Witch had tried to explain it further, Scarlet knew she would not have been capable of understanding at that time. The Elder seemed to have a certain connection with everyone in the room, but it was only a feeling, and a very private feeling at that. There was this sense that he acknowledged every person's sorrows, but it was only like a flicker, because immediately Scarlet felt an overwhelming sense of hope. And then, instead of avoiding his eyes, all she could do was stare at them. 
He told them a great many things that none of them were ever able to quite put into words after that day, but to which all of them seemed transformed in some way or another, and to which those things seemed to give them all a sense of comfort on difficult moments that lied ahead. One of the things that was remembered specifically was that the water of life in the pond had been given to Eldalata as a gift many centuries ago, but that its power was too great for men to handle and would likely lead to destruction again. The Elder gave the waters a new kind of magical property. It became like normal water again, but simply ever flowing and reaching to all corners of the land. He promised Eldalata to be nourished abundantly with that water, and that it would never dry up no matter the worst of droughts. For this reason, He said that there was no longer a need for guardians over the water, and that a return to normal life was also necessary. He turned specifically to the Red Witch, Scarlet, and Alerith. He told them how proud he had been of their personal sacrifices to save Eldolata from the evil wickedness of the Black One. He told the Red Witch that she had been chosen since birth to have magic, and that this was a gift she should not be without. He blinked his incredible blue eyes, and softly, silently, the Red Witch regained all her magic. Where she had once been immune to receive her own magic after giving it up, she was, once again, complete. The Elder spent a little more time with Alerith, though the time seemed to pass by so quickly for everyone else that no one noticed. He said that Scarlet and Alerith were born with magic for a reason and should therefore have it restored. He added that everyone is born with a kind of magic in some way, a strength or skill or benefit of sort. Magic may seem to some as a greater gift, but to others it may not be wanted. He highlighted that every person in the room sacrificed or confronted something difficult in order to defeat the Black One. All the efforts were equally important. No one person was greater than the other and no one gift was greater than the other. But Ilarith never felt again that she had only been created for the Black One's purpose, or that no one wanted her. She felt like, for the first time in her entire life, that she actually loved herself and was a complete person. For the first time ever as well, she cried tears of joy. Jasper was the only one who dared speak on his own accord, and asked the Elder if he could have his magic removed. The Elder smiled at him, and expressed that he was a valiant and noble man, deserving to keep the magic if he wished. But Jasper, in true, humble form, expressed that life already held a certain magic for him, to which the Elder smiled and recognized exactly what he had been referring to, or rather, to whom. The Elder blinked, and Jasper was restored to normal. No magic, and no aging delay spells. None of them received gifts of immortality that day. They didn't need to, and the Elder gave them only what they needed. He spent the longest time with Coyote, but again, their sense of time was distorted, and no one really knew for sure exactly how long they had been there. Coyote never revealed exactly what was exchanged between him and the Elder. Words had not even been used somehow, and from that day forward, he never again felt that sense of despair and shame that had taken hold of him that night on watch. In fact, he felt strangely worthy of Scarlet's love and could hardly wait to show her that he was actually capable of the same kind of love in return. The journey home was much faster, for they all awoke the next morning in their own beds with no recollection of how they got home, but yet there was a certain order and silent acknowledgement between them all that something rather remarkable had definitely happened in those ruins. Of course, there was also the proof in that Jasper no longer had magic, and that the Red Witch was fully magical again, along with her daughters. The 
The door flung open, and Alayrith barged into Scarlet's room. Guess who's getting married today? Scarlet rolled over in bed, the sunshine streaming in over her face. A smile overtook her face. She bolted up in her bed. I'm getting married today! The two girls screamed together in excitement as they both jumped up and down on Scarlet's bed. Scarlet then flopped down flat on her bed, looking up at the incredible cathedral ceiling. Elayrith flopped down next to her, staring up at the ceiling in amazement. Do you realize that not only are you becoming a wife today, but also a queen? I can't believe it. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> so what does a girl wear to her wedding that is simultaneously her coronation? I have absolutely no idea. Well, then we shall have to call for crisis support. Oh look, I'm already here. Oh stop. Seriously, we need to work on a dress. Well thank god we have magic. Paul Coyote might turn old and grey if he had to wait for a seamstress to sew the kind of dress I know you have in mind. Oh, you know me so well. So about red not being my colour? Oh, you know I totally made that up. What? Why would you ever make something like that up? I really don't know. But here's the thing. Elayrith got off the bed and looked very serious. I was so excited last night. I couldn't sleep. So I decided to work on designing your dress. And I think I came up with something that you would really love. I even showed Mother this morning, and she approved. I like that. Mother! All right, show me. Scarlet got off the bed and stood facing Alayrith. She looked down and saw the most magnificent dress she had ever seen in her life. It was extraordinary and opulent, fitting for a queen. Yet it also had a kind of simplicity and sweetness about it. It was a deep red with a gold damask pattern and golden accents across the neckline. Her hair was simple, long and straight, but pulled back elegantly. Elaith! Scarlet looked up at her sister. I could not have imagined anything more beautiful. Elaith beamed ear to ear. I thought it was fitting for you. <gasps> Scarlet! The two sisters turned around to find their mother walking into her room. Oh, forgive me for barging in, but oh, you look positively radiant. Her mother's eyes began to glisten with tears as she hugged Scarlet and then Alayrith. I could not ask for better daughters. Scarlet looked up at her mother. I miss you so much. I only wish father was here. He is here. He will always be with us in our hearts and one day we shall meet him again. Now, if I'm not mistaken, there is a young prince waiting to wed his bride, and there is also an entire kingdom waiting for a queen. The Red Witch smiled at her daughter. Are you ready, my dear? I've never been more ready in my life. The towering wood doors to the cathedral opened up, and Scarlet stood in the sunlight shining in her radiant gown. She looked up and saw Coyote waiting for her at the altar, with Jasper standing next to him. He looked entirely overcome with emotion. Scarlet began to walk down the aisle with her mother in arm. She reached the altar. Her mother kissed the top of her head and released her arm around Scarlet's. Coyote took her arm and whispered quietly to her, you look amazing. Coyote's parents officiated the ceremony together with the bishop. Scarlet and Coyote pledged their vows to one another in eternal love, and also pledged their allegiance and oath as new king and queen of the kingdom of Eldolota. The entire cathedral broke out in applause as they simultaneously wiped tears from their faces. The new king was told he could now kiss his wife the new queen. Coyote turned to Scarlet and gently placed his hand on the side of her neck as he stared deeply into her eyes before falling into a tender and passionate kiss. 
Elaerith blushed as she stood near the altar off on the side. She glanced up at Jasper and caught a glimpse that his face was even more red than Scarlet's gown. She smiled to herself. Coyote took Scarlet's hand and the two of them walked slowly down the aisle as everyone lowered their head and bowed as they confidently walked by. The doors were opened and thousands of people broke out in applause, waiting to see their new king and queen. Scarlet and Coyote stood at the top of the steps, waving to the crowds. The banquet that followed was equally magnanimous, but what everyone remembered the most, especially Scarlet, was the performance her sister gave in tribute to the newly wed couple. Yet sudden as night, her ends became something more. Once he was selfish, and she unassured, both felt the rules much The day went by in a fantastic blur for Scarlet and her new husband. There was wonderful dancing and endless food with wine, which was where Elayrith was found most of the time. I knew I would find you here. Jasper! <laughs> yes, well, I am celebrating life, as you said. And what not a better occasion? I'm really happy for my sister. She's a beacon to all that amazing things can be accomplished, so long as you never compromise your values. I remember that part of my life, sadly, when I thought war and vengeance would give me power, but little Scarlet, with her little heart and her little ways, did very, very big things. One of which was getting you up on that stage, Oh, I definitely did not peg you for a singer. Oh, is that so? <laughs> well, you were, uh, remarkable. Elayrith looked into Jasper's eyes, and all of a sudden, it was as if everything stopped. Elayrith, your parents may have given me to Scarlet as her guardian for a few years, but now Coyote is her guardian. And I wish, I wish to give myself to you for all days as your husband. I have fallen deeply in love with you, and if you will accept, 
it would make me the happiest man alive to call you my wife. Will you marry me, Alaris? Yes! Yes, I will marry you! And at that, Jasper leaned in closely and kissed Alaris very solemnly, completely oblivious to the fact that everyone in the ballroom had, in fact, actually stopped to watch them. Everyone broke out in applause and began dancing. Scarlet looked at her sister from across the room. Only a smile was exchanged, but a lot was communicated. Life truly was worth celebrating.